Should I should I do a shot and then cut my bangs? Is that Catherine's energy that we want to channel yeah, for this? It's absolutely Catherine's energy. Okay. And I say being the good bestie that I am, I'm gonna do it with you. All right, bestie. Let's go down the rabbit hole together. Wow, topical. We're about to get <laughs> mad tea party in here. What tea are you drinking, Honor? I am drinking gelatin shots. I'm drinking <laughs> fireball. Bottom's fucking up. <laughs> Okay, this one's um, watermelon flavored. The last was cherry. Okay, mine is still fireball. Ready? Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Hello, and welcome to Young Adult Adult Reviews, where two youngish adults review books meant for much younger adults. Or children. I'm Honor. And I'm Chloe. And this week we are discussing Heartless by Marissa Meyer. And if you haven't read it yet, here's the spoiler warning. We do have a content warning this week, and that is for eating disorders. And without further ado, we're going to get into the summary. Heartless is a retelling of the story of the Queen of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland. Catherine Pinkerton is a young daughter of a Marquis with a forbidden, unconventional dream. She wants to open a bakery with her best friend and maid, Mary Ann. Kath adores seeking perfection in her craft and wants nothing more than to pursue it for the rest of her life. But her mother would never allow it, especially as Catherine finds herself in the affections of the King of Heart. At the start of the book, Catherine has had a magical dream, which she discusses with her friend Cheshire Cat. She met someone with eyes the color of lemons, and a lemon tree grew out of the post by her bed. Catherine is forced into a too tight red dress by her mother to go to the King's black and white ball. She sticks out like a sore thumb and is horribly self-conscious about it. At the ball, we meet our zany cast of characters. Peter Peter, a poor pumpkin farmer who has recently been knighted. He is a physically imposing and brutal man with a frail wife. The King of Hearts himself, who is bumbling and not very intelligent. And drum roll, please. The new court joker who appears in a spectacular display. No one knows who he is or where he comes from. The court joker gives a spectacular performance and disappears without a trace. He and Catherine do share some intense eye contact, though. Following his performance, the king announces his engagement. With a dawning horror, Catherine realizes that he intends to propose to her right there. She asks Cheshire to stage a distraction and she flees the castle to the garden. In the garden, she faints at the sight of a shadowed shape like a hooded executioner holding an axe. When she awakes, she is in the court joker's company. She finds his name is Jest and he has a raven buddy who is the one casting that fearsome shadow. They share some flirty banter and we get the sense that Jest is a silly, good-natured, handsome guy. He makes sure that she eats and steals her corset string so that she can breathe a little easier. Easier. Oh, and did we mention he has yellow eyes? We did oh my god, it's that. like the dream! Kath returns home and has another steamy dream. This time she's making out with Jess in a rose field. Scandalous! This time she awakes with white roses sprouting from her bedpost. Her parents come home in the morning panicked. After Catherine left the ball, a legendary creature called the Jabberwock attacked and carried off two courtiers. The Jabberwock has not been seen in a while and no one knows where it came from. After their panic subsides, though, Kath's mother admonishes her for leaving the ball before her proposal can happen. So she forces Catherine to make the king some macarons using the roses from her dream as an apology and attend his tea party in three days' time. At the tea party, Jess entertains the king and Catherine. The king is about to try and pop the question again, but Jess interrupts, working with Catherine to imply that a long, long courtship period is generally preferred by women. The king backs off, instead playing croquet with the Jess makes a comment to Catherine that implies that she should get with the king. This clown is kind of sending mixed signals. Kath makes sure that they both lose the croquet game. That night, the king comes by Kath's house with his entourage and asks to court Catherine. With her parents there, she has to say yes, but with Jess watching from the corner as part of the entourage, it's hard to. Kath retires to her room and just appears at her window. He invites her to a real tea party. Thrilled by how forbidden it is, Kath lets him sweep her off her feet into the night. At the tea party, Kath meets some of Jess' friends, including the milliner Hatta, not yet mad. Hatta's hats have a way of influencing people, enhancing certain qualities to make them better. We later find out that this is because he crosses through the looking glass to the kingdom of chess, both to outrun his madness and to retrieve supplies to make hats with that have magical properties. <laughs> Catherine shares her talent of baking with people, but the merriment of that night is cut short when the Jabberwock attacks. Catherine manages to flee back through the crossroads, a system of doors that leads all through hearts, but not without the lion getting snatched by the Jabberwock. 
back at her house, Kat tells Jess that she can never do that with him again. It wasn't proper, and they can never be together anyway. He replies by telling her that he is not from Hearts, but rather he is a rook from the Kingdom of Chess, sent on a mission to save his country. What that mission is, though, remains to be determined. Later that day, Catherine tells Marianne everything about how taken she is with Jess. Mary Ann replies by telling her to keep her eyes on the real dream, the bakery. Catherine's family hosts an annual festival at Rock Turtle Cove, where there will be a baking contest with a monetary prize this year. The amount is enough for Catherine to pursue her dreams without asking her parents to sell her dowry. Catherine and Marianne go to Peter Peter's Pumpkin Farm to get some ingredients for a pumpkin cake. Peter Peter rejects them, and Catherine takes it into her own hands to steal a pumpkin from the patch that has been burned. In the dirt, though, she finds a tiny horse, a remnant of the carousel hat the lion was wearing when he got taken by the Jabberwock. At the Turtle Days Festival, Kat dances with the king, but she imagines herself with Jest. He takes her away from the action, and she has to reject him once again, though it pains her. Baking competition, however, goes less well. Her cake turns one of the judges into a mock turtle. The prize money is forgotten in the panic. After the disaster of the festival, Catherine forces herself to ask her parents about the bakery. They reject her, of course, and at her mention of Jess, they shoot down that idea too. They say that they know best what will make her happy. The king invites Catherine to the theater where tensions between her and Jess run high. Things only get worse when the Jabberwock attacks. Jess does his best to protect Catherine, but they get separated. He throws her his hat, which is a bottomless void of stuff, and she pulls out the Vorpal Sword, a legendary blade that can only be wielded by royalty. She aims to behead the Jabberwock, but only injures it. Catherine ends up breaking her leg in a gruesome injury. Jess says he will take her to get medical attention, but takes her to the treacle well instead, a supposedly mythical well that has treacle with hidden properties. A supposedly mythical well that has treacle with healing properties. It is guarded by three sisters who each demand an offering for their services. Jess tells Kath everything about his mission from the White Queendom of Chess. Time works differently there, and he said that in Hearts, there was a passionate and inspiring queen. Jess was sent to steal her heart and give it to the White Queen so that they might win the war. But when he arrived in Hearts, Catherine was not yet queen. He fell for her, though, and can't bring himself to steal her heart anymore. Catherine tells him that her heart is his no matter what. She agrees to reject the king's impending proposal, and she and Jess kiss for, like, a long time. Anyway, Jess takes Catherine back to Hearts <laughs> and is promptly arrested on the spot for abducting Catherine. Marianne has told everyone everything, which all the more damns him. He escapes, and Catherine resigns herself to the king. She is furious with Marianne. At a masquerade ball, the king intends to propose to Catherine. Jess appears in a mask and they share a dance. He disappears, then reappears and tells Catherine that there is a way that they can have everything. They can be together, they can save the White Queendom, and she can have her bakery. She runs away with him without even questioning it. Jess tells Catherine about the law of promotion. In chess, if a pawn makes it to the border of the opposite side, they can become queen. Catherine could lead them to victory, then step down so that they can be together, because a rook roughly equals a marquess in chess. They were retrieve Hatta, who is still mad at Catherine for playing with Jess's heart, and they head back to the treacle well to go through the looking glass. The sisters give an ominous prophecy before they pass through. Out of Raven, Hatta, Jess, and Calf, each one will take the title of monarch, murderer, martyred, or mad. A drawing of Jess beheaded accompanies the prophecy. If they don't want it to come to pass, they shouldn't go through any doors. The crew almost makes it to Chess, but a scream from the crossroads draws Catherine away. It's from a door that leads to Peter's pumpkin patch, and the scream belongs to none other than Mary Ann. She has to go. She tells everyone to wait, and she'll be right back. In the pumpkin patch, Catherine finds Mary Ann, who tells her that the Jabberwock is Peter's wife. He is going to feed Marianne to her. Peter comes out with an axe and just appears in the nick of time to distract him from Catherine while Raven and Hatta free Marianne. Peter sees Hatta and turns his sights on him. It turns out the pumpkins his wife ate, Peter grew from seeds that Hatta brought from chess. They turned his wife into the Jabberwock after she ate them. Catherine removes the Vorpal Sword from Jess's hat and saves Hatta by slaying the Jabberwock by cutting off its head. Peter, stricken with grief, looks at Catherine, and then he swings his axe. Jess jumps into its path, and he gets beheaded. Catherine's mind is muddied by grief. Days pass in a stupor, and then the sisters from the treacle well approach her with an offer. They will offer her revenge against Peter if she gives them the heart of a queen to sustain them. Catherine accepts. She strong arms the king into marrying her, and she accepts her role with grace and power. Raven is her new closest confidant. They both lost the same person that they loved dearly. Hatta is mad with grief, also loving Jest. One day in court, the sisters appear with Peter in chains. They deposit him in Catherine's presence and steal her heart. She no longer feels grief. She is no longer in pain. After a short trial, the jury of hearts declares Peter not guilty. Catherine overrules them all, calling for his head. Raven, who served as the White Queen's executioner, now extends himself as Catherine's will. 
She observes Peter from her throne and utters the quintessential line, off with his head. The end. Roll fucking credits. She said mic drop. Honestly, what did you think of this book? I liked it. It was good. I love villain origin stories. Mm -hmm. I think they're just so much fun because you see the humanity that's in them before they become the villain and all you see is the dark side. So you get to see that journey of where their humanity is basically like ripped from them. Mm -hmm. And I just find that so utterly interesting because, you know, a lot of times when you see villains and they're already a villain, you don't see that human side of them. You don't acknowledge that they were once human or they have human qualities within them. And all of these origin stories just throw that at your face and you're like, oh, dang, maybe they're not the worst person in the world. They were misunderstood at the start and then became the worst person in the world. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I totally get what you're saying. I will say I started reading this book and I didn't I didn't realize it was like a retelling of the Queen of Hearts until I opened it up and I started reading it and then I was like, oh fuck. But at that point I realized that I was like, this is not going to be a happy ending, is it? <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with Hades Town the musical, but it's like a retelling of Orpheus and Eurydice and that monomyth. And in a way, this is kind of like a monomyth in itself. And a line from Hades Town that I just kept thinking of while I was reading this book. It's a sad song and we all know how it ends, but we keep wanting to play it again to see if it fucking changes, but it doesn't. And it's always sad and always ends the same way. And I think, I don't know, when Just died, I wasn't sad because I feel like I was mourning his death the whole book until the moment that it happened. Because I knew there was no way that he got out of the situation alive. No, literally, because you were texting me and panicking. You were like, Honor, Honor, I really like him. I can't handle this. I know he's going to die. And I was like, well, she has to become a villain somehow. And you're like, but he's going to (laughs) die. And he did. It happened so suddenly. I was at work. I literally told you this was going to happen. I said, I'm going to be reading it at work and he's going to die. I was like, you kidding me? And then I read it twice and I was like, huh, (laughs) I didn't expect. It felt like it came out of nowhere. I was shocked. I did not feel like it came out of nowhere because they literally had a prophecy for it. Okay, well, not out of nowhere. But like 50 pages from the end of the book. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, what the hell is going to happen in 50 pages? A lot. Yeah, I did think it felt a little bit early for the death to happen, but I wasn't shocked that that was where it happened because it Mm -hmm. seemed fitting. It was like right when the dust settled after the storm of, you know, murdering the Jabberwock and everything looks like oh we made it out everyone's gonna be fine the prophecies aren't gonna come true and then the dust settles and then death it's always the deaths that come right at the end when everything is so easily avoidable that are the most tragic it's so sad and he was a good boy he was you made me think that he was gonna be like a golden retriever puppy kind of person when you were like texting me about it because you read it before i did Mm mm-hmm and so this whole time I'm like, oh, I'm not going to like enjoy this. I you don't, don't like the I'm... golden retriever type? I Well, I don't dislike them. They're just not my favorite type. I like the dark, broody, mysterious, which was okay. just so. <laughs> He's a mysterious golden retriever and I'm going to stand by that. I will die on that hill. He is a, I... he is a crossbreed. I don't think he's a golden retriever. <laughs> I absolutely think he is for calf. He's for a golden Kath? retriever for calf. It's funny though. He is so taken by her. It's adorable. And so their first meeting in the garden, are you kidding me? He's He's like, like, here, you haven't eaten all night. Here's a chocolate. And also you can't breathe. So I'm going to steal your corset strings. And it's like the line where it's like, oh my God, that's so scandalous. But also like, oh, it's really sweet. It's like clutching at your pearls, but also fanning your face. My favorite is like, she's like, wow, I can breathe easier. Like the corset seems looser. That's so strange. Like he's so magical. And then they get to the carriage and she goes to walk in it. And he's like, by the way, here's your corset strings. And she's just like, (laughs) oh my God. (laughs) Cause she was like, she was like, oh, I just needed to eat. And then he like handed that to her. And he was like, it was actually both. And her maid's like, how did you get out of that? And she's like, oh, you know. (laughs) It just loosened overnight. How weird. <laughs> it's crazy. That's crazy. Did you cry at the end night? Okay. Or anywhere in the book? I did not cry because by the time that just died, I had already fully mourned him. And by the time that he died, all that remained was like a sense of shock that it happened A, the way that it did, and B, that it happened so soon. Because honestly, I was kind of expecting Kath to have a direct hand in his death. 
which I guess we can argue on and off. Yes, she did. No, she didn't. Whatever. I thought she was going to be the one swinging the axe more directly or the one giving the order to swing the axe. I thought he was going to break her heart. That makes sense. Mm Mm-hmm. No, I thought that was what was going to turn her. But no, I did not cry. Also, when I read that scene, I was at work, so I could not cry. I wasn't about to cry into my Chipotle bowl. Just a few tears, like one little drop. (laughs) Did you cry? No. Oh, yeah. I feel like this book would have some people crying because I definitely think that in Just Death, it goes for the shock factor Mm -hmm. in terms of how quickly it happens and how it happens. Because it's this very interesting thing and I can't put my finger on what it is. But the author, Marissa Meyer, she tells you how it's going to happen. She tells you the conditions that they need to go through in order for it to happen. And they check all these boxes and you still want to believe in your heart. Oh, it's not going to happen. And then it fucking happens and you're like, well, shit. What else can you say? Yeah, I think because I was expecting it through the whole time, because I was like, I knew something had to happen for, you know, her to become evil. Like, mm-hmm. that's just how it is to become the villain. I was like, okay, I know he's going to die the whole time. I'm going to try not to get too attached to him. Mm-hmm. Failed at that one. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, me so too. Cute. He's cute. Girl. He's a cutie. And then the prophecy came up and I was like, okay, it's going to have to be around here that it's gonna happen i thought it was gonna be originally before it got to the prophecy i thought the king was gonna have a hand in it Mm. because i figured the king would be like off with his head and then she would be so mad that that would start being her thing and then she would murder the king and that was because when the prophecy came up and it said she was holding like a heart on a sword Mm -hmm. like i was like ah that's the king's heart but no (laughs) no the king got to live that was less fun Yeah, he's a bumbling idiot. One thing that I did like that this book did is that it didn't really give you the gross old man arranged marriage trope. It gave you the, he's nice, but I don't really like him kind of trope. And I feel like you don't see that a lot, especially in contexts like this, in terms of royal and nobility arranged marriages. Because it's like, oh no, I can't. He's so cruel. He's so mean. It's like, there's nothing wrong with him. He's just not great. (laughs) Literally. The only fault that I had with him was that he would not do anything to protect the kingdom. Oh, he was if spineless. It, oh, absolutely. He just had no backbone to be able to protect the people. He was like, oh, the only way that I can make this better is to put their minds off of it and onto a party because I like parties. And I was like, that's not how to be a king. And Kath was like, that's not how to be a king. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, no, something that I really liked was that it kind of examined that idea of like, just because they're nice doesn't mean you have to say yes. Doesn't mean you have to like them. Doesn't mean you even have to like them even a little bit. Kath despised him. She didn't really have an explicit reason to, but he was spineless and he wasn't a good ruler. And she hated the idea of imagining spending the rest of her life with him. Mm -hmm. And even though he was nice enough, he was a nice guy, quote unquote, she still couldn't bring herself to do it. And I like that it really didn't force her to settle into that role a kind of complacency and settling for second place. She always strove for the best. She strove for perfection. She strove for first. And when she didn't get it, she said, fuck it and did scorched earth. And I respect her for that. (laughs) She's kind of a girl boss for that one. She is. I'm proud of her. With her reaction after the death of Jest, did you think that made the ending good or bad? Like, what was your opinion of the ending? I liked the way that she portrayed her grief. And I also liked that she accepted the deal for revenge. Because I feel like, and you can or refute this however you agree, I feel like she kind of lacked agency throughout the whole story until Jest die. I don't think that she had any agency of her own until Jess died. Even when he said, come with me if you want to have everything. She still went with him because she trusted him to lead the way. But she didn't start paving her own path. She needed him to die to become her own person, which I think makes it all the more tragic because her whole fucking life, she's following what her mother says, what her father says, what the king says, what Marianne says they should do. And she never really makes a decision for herself until that pact she makes with the sisters for Peter Peter's head. Even Jess told her the same thing, but I I fully agree with that. She did nothing for herself until it was too late. Absolutely, yes. And that's also what makes her so fucking tragic. But to that point, I would argue that she does not see herself really having a hand in just death. She does not see herself as having been a part of the problem for anything that went wrong in that book. She was always turning around and constantly blaming someone else. She would blame Marianne. She would blame her parents. She would blame the people that didn't give her money for her bakery. She would blame the king. She blamed Peter Peter. Like, she was never at fault for anything. 
Absolutely. I thought that was so interesting. No, and like the real interesting thing about it, literally, like uh, Catherine's like grieving after Jess is dead, and she's like, "Oh, I'd go back and do it again." She's like, "I blame Hada for bringing the pumpkins. I blame Hada for giving Marianne the hat. I blame Marianne for making me go back for her." Just all of this shit. And the real interesting is like she is like that through the whole book almost, and I didn't even really care about it until I thought about it enough to play devil's advocate and to be like. Kath is kind of lacking agency for herself. Mm-hmm. That's not to say that she's not a good character. I think she's a very well-written character, but she is deeply flawed in the sense that she doesn't see anything wrong with herself. But I think that's what leads so well into her becoming a villain is because she doesn't put all of that on her. She wants to blame everybody else. So that gives her that anger and that vengeance against other people. Mm-hmm. And that's what leads into that aggression and everything that turns her into the villain and, and it's leads her such, to taking it out on the world yes and it's such a good like downward spiral that whirls into this storm at the end of her saying off with his head that just is it's almost perfectly done oh absolutely i would totally agree because uh i think that also shows in her banning white roses because again that ties into like oh the queen of hearts hates white roses she'll only mm-hmm. if you plant roses you better only be red because Of course, in her mind, Jess is associated with white roses. So she Mm -hmm. blames everyone for planting the roses. And she's like, oh, you did that to upset me. Yeah, she doesn't want to see it as a reminder. Mm -hmm. So I had had two things with the white roses bit. Is I wanted to see when the rabbit was like, oh, that's such an old tree. Like, we can't chop it down because it was planted by a great, 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 whatever grandfather. I wanted her to be like, then fucking paint it red, you know? I wanted to see that part that brought in and said she was like, if you don't tear it down, I'm going to take your head kind of thing. And I was like, okay, I mean, yeah, that's a right reaction, but it's not what I wanted. Second of all, (laughs) (laughs) it was interesting to me to see how she reacted to all of the white roses and things is because that was a reminder of Jess to her. But most people, when they are in grief, want to cling and hold on to anything they have left of that person. But she said, this is a reminder, get rid of it. She revolted in anger. Yeah. Even though she loved him, she was so hurt and angry that she couldn't accept even that little trivial reminder of him. I have a question for you. Do you think that she revolted in anger to all these reminders of Jess due in part to her believing that it was her fault that he died. Well, I don't think she really acknowledged the fact that it was, in quotes, her fault that he died. Because like we said, she never took the blame for anything. However, I think like a very inner part of her Mm -hmm. felt that way and like knew that that ax was aimed for her and that he got in the way and that because she had gone into that world and he had followed, like, I think she felt that it was on her and she didn't want to accept that or acknowledge it. So I think that's why even the little reminders made her angry because it was like a little bit of guilt lingered there under all of the anger and the pain that she was feeling. And Mm -hmm. so rather than let herself delve into that sadness that she felt, she took the anger and held on to it as much as possible, which we saw that with the fact that she was so willing to get rid of her heart and all of that pain and that sadness that she was feeling. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree. And to the note of playing devil's advocate, if you will. I feel like Hatta is very much that character that plays the voice of the devil's advocate because he's the one that like calls her out. He's like, you think that you don't know what you're doing and that you don't have a choice, but you do have a choice. And you know for a fact that one person is going to end the situation with a broken heart. You cannot deny that. And she didn't want to listen to him. She didn't want to hear him. And in fact, she turned it on him and she said, your hats are dangerous, which is a very funny sentence to say so seriously. But- no, I, okay. So I loved Tata's character. Oh, I me think too. It was, I think it was horrible that he let himself fall into that madness and that she let him fall into that because she wanted to blame him. She didn't want to accept the blame for herself. But every little moment that he had, he was like, you aren't doing this correctly. Like, you know that you're leading Jess Dawn. Stop it. And she wouldn't do it. And he's like, you know that you want to blame me for the hats being the problem, but it was your pie that the turtle ate kind of thing. And mm-hmm. she didn't want to accept it the entire time. Just like you were saying, he would throw all those things at her and be like, pay attention to what you're doing. And she'd be like, I'm blind. She said, la, 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 la. I can't hear you. I do not see <laughs> literally Uh, exactly but i loved his character he deserved better i'm not gonna lie i did see it coming that he was gonna be in love with jess around the part when he got mad at her at the turtle days festival 
because he was like, oh, you're just playing with his heart. I was like, oh, so you like him. You're like in love yeah. with him, aren't you? I could tell. <laughs> Kath was like, did he know? And it's like, girly, we all knew. But kind of sad. Still kind of sad. It was. What? I think there was just like so much connection between all of them. Because even the Raven was like so hurt over it that he was willing to help Kath like go through with the murder of Peter Peter. The beheading, Mm -hmm. if you will. Hada was the same sort of way. He just grieved in a different way. He lost Mm -hmm. himself into madness rather than kind of face what was going on. Well, Hada's case is especially interesting because it's not just that he lost himself to madness and grief. It's also that it was hereditary in his family. And he could have gone back to chess if he wanted. But I feel like after Jess died, he just gave up. And there was yeah, no reason ch- for him to return to chess. So he stayed right. in Wonderland. He chose that life because that was, I think for him, it was almost easier than continuing spending that time. Mm-hmm. And that awareness of everything. Easier to succumb to madness than to grief, for sure, yep. than to cope with grief. I did think it was very sad that he kind of lost himself on the the rhyme, the raven's desk, the raven in the writing desk. How are they oh my saying? god, that broke my heart because earlier was, in the story, he's he like, had, oh, which answer did he give you? And he had two answers for the riddle and then he couldn't even come up with one. I know, it was so sad, but I did like how everything kind of tied itself into Alice in Wonderland like into mm-hmm. that coming story like they even talked about the rabbit hole that went upside down like mm-hmm. carried the little girl through I was like all those little hints and bits and the raven with the Edgar Allan Poe references it was beautifully done mm-hmm. I'm gonna be outing myself here I've never read the original like the Lewis Carroll <laughs> Alice in Wonderland so I don't know I'm assuming it draws a lot of inspiration from that specifically from that source material more so than like the Disney version because it strikes me as very well researched it strikes me as tonally accurate it was just like a very well written prose throughout the book like I can't I was totally immersed just from the language alone in the world of Wonderland like I didn't have to read the source material you know on the note of it kind of being a thing that leads into Alice in Wonderland. Gregory Maguire, the author of Wicked, has a review on the back of my book. And Wicked, of course, is like what happens in Wizard of Oz before Dorothy comes in. When I saw that he had reviewed the book and read it and gave his input on it, I was like, oh, maybe it'll be something like Wicked. In the musical Wicked, Alphaba gets her happy end and she like fakes her death and shit. And I was like, oh, maybe it's going to be something like that. I thought I was holding out like a, a sliver of hope, but I felt like it wasn't going to be that entirely because Elphaba gets her happy end in Wicked, but Catherine does not get her happy end in this. And I will never forgive Gregory Maguire for letting me hold out hope for reviewing this book that Catherine was going to get her happy end with Jess. I'm not going to lie. I thought they were going to like pull this weird shit with time because they were like, oh, time works differently in chess. So I thought that they were going to pull this weird shit where she would go back into chess through the looking glass and Jess would be there waiting for her. And I thought that was how she was going to get her happy ending. And I was like, maybe that's what they'll do. And that's what the last 40 pages are for. No, Wait, that's so cute. But that that would have been such an interesting tie in because when they first met, he was like, oh, you dreamed about me. Maybe you were dreaming of the future like <sighs> version of myself. And then which, no! would have been, which would have been his past self, which would be why he knew who she was. Ah, that would have oh. been so much better. Jesus Christ. And no, and then I thought, and then I thought, somebody ring Marissa Meyer right now. (laughs) Hello, sequel. But then I thought, (laughs) wouldn't it be all the more tragic if she went back through the looking glass to chess after she had already given her heart away? And then he's there waiting for her, but she doesn't have the heart to love him. That was the fan fiction I wrote in my mind. So that's, that's my little input. It could have gone in that direction, but (laughs) no complaints about the ending from my end. It's very much like roll credits, movie magic, cut. That's a wrap. You know, I think that just hurt my heart more than the actual death of him did. <laughs> Damn. Marissa Meyer, are you interested in a collaboration? <laughs> we have ideas for a sequel. <laughs> it can take place after Alice in Wonderland, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that way there's no continuity errors in the timeline. Exactly. So all of the stuff happened. She gets to go back and then and then maybe they can like rehunt down to her heart. I don't know. They give her a new one. Who knows? They go after it. It's fine. Marissa, you're the author. I'm just giving you the ideas. Jess gives her his heart. <gasps> no. 
Yes, he was. Oh my god, we have to stop writing fan fiction. This is a book review, not a fan fiction writing sesh. Jesus Christ. Oh my god. Okay, what surprised you the most about this book? Were there any plot twists that kind of came out of nowhere? I mean, I feel like everything was a little bit kind of off kilter just because Wonderland. So you don't quite expect where things are going to take mm-hmm. place. For example, like them traveling to chess and all of that stuff. And then, oh, surprise, they're not actually going. I, I <laughs> That's how I felt. <laughs> I mean, you can't really expect all of that. However, the, like, major plot twists and things, the whole time you're trying to figure out, like, where's the Jabberwock coming? How are they going to handle taking care of that? And then you find out that it's Peter Peter's wife and stuff. Well, you saw it coming. Yeah, I figured that out really early on because I I started guessing it at the second time the Jabberwock came in because I was, huh, what's happening here? This is weird. I was like, it seems too coincidental for it to be like Jabberwock and not like a person. And then the theater was where I actually figured it out because the wife was so desperate about the pumpkin pies. I was like, oh, that makes sense. Pumpkin pies, magic, it turned to the turtle. So therefore mm-hmm. she eats them. She turns into the Jabberwock. I wasn't quite positive enough that I wanted to share it with you, but I was like, I'm pretty sure. And then after that point, it was like everything just clicked into place confirming mm-hmm. it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I thought the Jabberwock had something to do with Jess' quest to save the White Queendom because it appeared in every single scene that he was in and that he was significant in because the first time he appears in the royal court, Jabberwock is there. Mm -hmm. Tea party, Jabberwock is there. Opera, Jabberwock is there. I didn't realize that the wife also could have been in all those places. The wife wasn't at the tea party. Exactly, which is why I was like, oh, I feel like this is just, and he's hiding something from Catherine Mm -hmm. to keep her kind of like in the dark about his mission. It almost seemed like it, for the first two times, it was coming after Catherine herself. Exactly. So I was like, oh, maybe this has something to do with his royal mission, and he's so desperate to protect her, so maybe a conflict of interest. I didn't realize that the Jabberwock was Peter Peter's wife until the sisters at the well recited the poem about Peter Peter and his pumpkin patch. I do have an additional question for you, Honor. So I have not read the Lunar Chronicles by Marissa Mayo yet. Oh, that was um, so good. But yeah, how did this book stack up to other books by Marissa Meyer? To answer this question, granted, I listen or listened and read the books probably, I want to say like 11th grade. So this was like five, six years ago. Mm-hmm. They're very different ideas because the Lunar Chronicles takes the fairy tales and twists them into like a futuristic alternate universe kind of an idea mm-hmm. versus the Heartless is a retelling, but it's a, like prequel. So they're yeah. different in that aspect. However, storyline wise and like retelling in the details of the fairy tales, I felt were very accurate. They're very similar in both books. Like, you get all those little details. Things are different. This one, the characters were all kind of the same as in the stories versus in Lunar Chronicles, there's different twists and aspects to each of the characters versus this maintains a little more true reality to what they were as it's supposed to be more of a prequel kind of an idea. So that makes sense. In this one, they were just like, Um, they were all young and hot. And I appreciated that one. (laughs) Same in Lunar Chronicles. (laughs) I really like them. I think that they're good. I don't know if you can really compare them to each other other than the writing style and the ideas behind it because those are, I think, match up really well. But I think just because Lunar Chronicles is a twist on the story versus this is just a a prequel reality to it, Mm -hmm. that you can't compare that too much. So the prose in this is similar to Lunar Chronicles? Yeah. Oh, I think so. Yes. I absolutely adore adored the prose in this book it was incredibly tonally consistent and so incredibly whimsical never a dull moment i will state that if i'm remembering correctly this is a little bit more whimsical as i would imagine it's wonderland yeah it's wonderland so but there is some whimsy i felt in the lunar chronicles story you really need to read that we should do that one soon we're we're doing it soon it's on our list in like in like three weeks yeah no don't don't tell them six weeks i don't know (laughs) Shut up. What? Spoilers. Shut up. Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's why I asked because I made a note. And I was like, oh, two Marissa Myers in one cycle. Right? Oh, I'm so excited for you to read Lunar Chronicles. Me too. It is so good. Adorable. Anyway, we're not on Lunar Chronicles. This is Heartless. Do you feel heartless after this story? Is this your way of asking the question of how the book impacted my mood? Yes. I think the sign a very well-written book is to fool the reader to be on the main character's side and not really think about playing devil's advocate. And that is what- Especially 
with the villain origin story especially oh my god I was so ready to be on her side I was like all right Kath let's go ride or die (laughs) I didn't even consider the possibility that she was doing anything wrong until like halfway through the book and I was like maybe Kath could be doing a little bit better for herself you know but in terms of like how that impacted my mood just like I love when I get girl boss by the writers (laughs) Honestly, we've been doing really well with that. Most of our books have been Girl Boss vibe. I forgot the Girl Boss of the week last week, but for the record, it would have been Dana Taylor. Yeah. In this week, in this week, Catherine is the Girl Boss through and through. She Girl Boss so hard, she Girl Boss herself into thinking that she didn't have a hand in her boyfriend's death. Okay, so we talked about the impact on your mood. Did that also affect like the pacing of the book for you? How did you feel on that? I will say this about the pacing. It's a long book, but not in like an arduous way. It's just long as like, oh, we're going over here and now we're going over here and now we're going over there. It's a long journey to take, but it's not a dull one because I look at the word counts and this one clocks in 452 pages, a little over 130,000 words, if I'm not mistaken. Did not feel like that. I just kind of like flipped through and I was very excited to read it. I was excited to see where we were going next in the story. So even though it was kind of a long story, I didn't think it was a boring one. Mm -hmm. How about you? Yeah. So like you kind of said, it was like over here and over here and over here. And because of that, I felt it was kind of sectioned for the pacing. Mm. Like each event was was set at a really good pace but then you'd kind of have a moment and then it was the next event so it was like bumps and hills in the pacing for me and mm-hmm. it wasn't bad. I was engaged the whole time, but there were moments that I was just kind of like, uh, okay, I want to put this up for like a minute because I'm just I, I need a second. Mm-hmm. Should um, I out you and say that you finished the book like <laughs> 10 minutes before recording this podcast? Should I out you, you and say that? Should you out me and say that I started literally the night before? Hey, I finished it in time and you know what one might argue that that's a testament to how good the book is because even though you were like under a time crunch and it might be kind of difficult to do that you still finished it and you finished it so that we could still record the next day after you started reading it and I enjoyed it and you enjoyed it it wasn't like a deadline thing it was just oh I gotta gotta rush to the end I got suckered in specifically with like her emotions with Jess because she was like oh I'm in love with him and I was like girl me too and she's like oh my god he's so funny and I was like girl yes (laughs) I was with her that whole romantic journey I was kind of annoyed with her about the fact that she was like oh I have to do these things that my parents are telling me I have to go accept the king's courting and all of this stuff and blah 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 and I was like girl you have a choice cut it out like just is here take the bait Mm -hmm. he's right here all shiny nice and pretty new toy oh my god and the fact that he stuck around and was still a dog at her fucking heels and I don't mean that in like a bad way I just mean he he acted like a dog at her fucking heels the amount of times she rejected him said this can't happen said you are not good enough for me and he was still no 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 no. she never said he was not good enough for her she wanted him he was so good enough for her so he wasn't good enough for her socially yes yeah socially yes he wasn't good enough for yes Correct. I just make that clear. Right. Anyway, I was fully along with her emotional ride right up until Jess died. And then after that point, I was like, eh, Agreed. I'm, not, I'm not with you, girl. Well, I was I with felt- her in the grief. I was like, honestly, girl, do what you need to do to process this. And then she didn't quite process it. She kind of did an unhealthy coping mechanism. That's where I lost her. <laughs> like, you don't do the same. Anyway. Hey. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you said goodnight. <laughs> I mean, and usually, like, I'm one for the villains if they're doing it right, but she, I didn't feel like she was doing it right. Do you think that had anything to do with the journey that she took to get there and how much she wallowed in blaming other people? No, I think it was less that she didn't allow herself to feel that pain and sorrow. And so, while, you know, in grief because Jess was dead, I didn't feel the mourning that she was feeling. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why I lost the connection. I wanted to feel so utterly torn up about this that I was like, you should be a villain. You should go get revenge. You should do this. And then so I was like, okay, well, she's a villain now. All right. Mm-hmm. So she kind of lost me with that aspect because I just wanted to, f- I wanted her to feel the pain so much that I couldn't help but feel it. And she Mm -hmm. didn't even let that happen to herself. I did love the way that they wrote the scene where they took out her heart, though. And they talked about it being cracked and it was like blackened and filled with ash. And I was like, that was just beautiful. Mm -hmm. I was like, that, that hurt a little. Well, that also showed (laughs) how much she was suppressing that she just didn't fucking talk about. She talked about pushing it down and down and down. And I think that was what was creating that fissure in her 
Oh, for sure. It's a broken heart. Her heart. That part, that part was beautiful, but I did want to feel that pain that she felt. Instead, she just turned it to anger. And I was like, you're just masking it. I wasn't mad about turning the anger in terms of what we thought of the ending. I thought the ending was good, a good depiction of an unhealthy coping mechanism with grief because Mm -hmm. we talked about Divergent and talked about how that represented grief very well. Heartless does not depict it well, but I think that that's the point. Mm -hmm. She's bad at grief because she's never really had to mourn anything before because she's never loved anything before because she's never wanted anything so fucking desperately before and now that she has and she's lost it she doesn't know how to deal with it and we started to see those reactions come through with her bakery which the first which was the first thing she kind of loved and she talked about it a little bit with the fact the storytelling that she wanted to do when she was younger she talked about the anger showing up there and then with the bakery it was when she had her last final attempt to go see hatter you saw all the anger coming out there when the hatter started refusing her so i thought that was an interesting tell and lead up into that anger from grief that she was having Mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely okay so question for you did the book strike you as original there's an interesting way to interpret that question in relation to a book being based off source material and honestly yeah a retelling i thought it was refreshing i thought it was new because there are bad and unoriginal retellings how many king arthur movies have come out how many fucking alice in wonderland movies have come out There are ways to do it poorly and in an unoriginal way, but I don't think this is it. I think Mm -hmm. this does it phenomenally. I think it puts a fresh spin on it. I think that, especially in the way that she writes her characters, it makes it so that it doesn't feel old and worn out, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. What about you? Yeah, I would say that it's unoriginal in the idea that it is from source material that's already been done. Yeah. Um, and that it's a villain origin story. But I think it was extremely unoriginal in her writing style and her plot lines and the way that she twisted everything into a lead up into Alice in Wonderland. So I I thought it was extremely well done. I thought, like you said, it it had all of those original ideas to it and it had so many good fresh twists to it that made it original in its own way. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going to come to this part of the discussion because I say so. Oh, all right. Let's talk about the depiction of an eating disorder in this book. Okay, so a big part of Kat's character is that her mother restricts her eating, shames her for eating, and kind of promotes this image of Catherine what? in her mind that is not what is real it's body dysmorphia body dysmorphia yeah body dysmorphia and yeah like she even like sit she tells just like all this and she's like oh i can't eat in this dress it's too tight and he feeds her and he makes sure that she eats and she says oh i can't climb up there with you i'm as big as a walrus and he He says that's fucking ridiculous he was mad about that one he sat back he pulled his hand away from her and he went no we're not gonna do this right now (laughs) he's like i don't know if you want to get caught or what but you're not a fucking walrus just come up here with me but But it's um, because at at every turn her mother was saying put down that food you look like a walrus you need to get into tinier dresses your corset needs to be tighter like every opportunity that her mother had she was throwing those things back at Catherine and the interesting thing was at the very end when Catherine was in her wedding dress and she looks at her mother and she goes oh am I a walrus you're gonna tell me I'm beautiful aren't I a walrus and her mother looks shocked at that Mm -hmm. that pissed me off i almost wish that she had gone a little bit more full send on the eating disorders because as someone who has an interesting relation with food myself i think that it could have been a really good dynamic to delve into and try and accurately and faithfully represent in books because for the first for the first few chapters I felt like it was very accurate and I don't know like you feel seen in the first few chapters when Catherine is kind of struggling with like oh I don't want to eat I need to look like this I don't want to eat I look like a walrus but then she kind of like goes into that idea of recovery with Jess but then it like also gets into the idea of like the savior trope with like the guy being the savior that fixes all the woman's problems which not all about because it's also like a mental disorder but I almost wish that they had also gotten into it after he died because I do believe the implied anorexia and how much she wanted to eat sweets but restrained herself would build up to the depiction of the queen of hearts that is fat and how that could have evolved into a binge eating disorder. I think that that was a missed opportunity personally to try and accurately and faithfully represent that on the page but I feel like it was abandoned halfway through the book. And that's just my perspective. That might not be accurate to say or anything. That is just how I felt. I felt like it was good 
And then they just forgot about it. And it never really got brought up too many times again. The first couple chapters of it felt like it was very much her internalization of it. It was her disorder kind of a thing. And then as the book kind of continued, it sort of became, oh, I don't have those thoughts. It's thoughts my mother is putting in my head. Like it wasn't internalized from her. It was her mother's internalization that she was then kind of taking on. So I think as she kind of like distanced herself from her mother, that changed a little bit and not fully because like you're not going to get over that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like to me. It stopped being like an internalized feeling for her. And I think that's why it sort of changed. But I agree with the fact that like it is interesting to see how it goes from almost an anorexia kind of thing because she won't touch food a lot of times Mm -hmm. into the like binge eating disorder Mm -hmm. because they can take that farther and I feel like she could have started a binge eating disorder out of grief not knowing what else to do with her emotions she just eat the pastries that she cooked that she was never allowed to have and her mother's finally too afraid to say anything so she just goes for it maybe that's in the sequel the sequel that we wrote yeah maybe bestie maybe (laughs) that's just my two cents on it i did like that like such a serious topic like that was put into the story and it was included in a way where it wasn't like the forefront of everything going on but it was still an integral thing that was happening absolutely anyway i just wanted to talk about that (laughs) well it needs to be brought up i think so too especially with like the fact that it wasn't outright said and like i don't blame her for not outwardly saying it because it's very much not really a tonally accurate word to say anorexia is in wonderland but I do think it's an interesting lens to view this story through and I think it's also a good way to again add a little bit of humanity to the villain and give her something that so many women struggle with we were like going through and you had me text you each little thing that she was eating because you read it after me yeah yeah and it was like she had one hard-boiled egg and it's like that's not enough to sustain anybody no i think for the first half of the book she has a hard-boiled egg the truffle three bites of a pumpkin and a meat pie and and a bite of a macaroon and some tea and that's it for like i think maybe like a week of in book time And that's all it mentions her eating, even though like it also actively shows her craving these things and being like, I am so hungry, but I cannot eat. And the worst part is I, you know, I think she was eating like when the book wasn't talking about it kind of thing. But you see firsthand when she's that hungry and she starts to eat it, if her mother is there, she's not allowed to. Her mother like slaps the food away from her, tells the maids to take it away kind of thing. She even does, Mm -hmm. the mother even does it to the father. No, it's fucked up. I don't don't know if I made my point other than it is fucked up. I had, I had like an actual thought on that one. But what other, what other point is there to make it's fucked it's fucked i hated the mom i hated her oh my god right Ugh, what a bitch i hate i hated that i hated that so much yeah yeah her parents were fucking infuriating on that one i really oh thought her dad god. was gonna be on her side for a little bit there okay honor yeah. we are going to play the blame game if you had to put uh... the blame on one person for just death whose would it be whose fault is it I'm going to kind of link this back. First of all, I'm not thrilled with Catherine, but I'm going to say this one's not her fault, okay? Because I think I'm going to blame Marianne. And okay. I, I know this is like, wow, like you're just like Kath. That's exactly who she blamed. But there's a damn good reason. Okay, first of all, first of all, she had the unhelpful problem that she had this like bonnet on that made her a dreamer. And her dream was to go, I think she wanted to go slay, like find the Jabberwocky or whatever. It, and, like, it, it was like a hat made by Hatta that made small ideas big, right? Like that right, was the whole thing. Right, it made thing. her into a dreamer person. Mm-hmm. And she wanted to be the hero and solve the problem and have Kath forgive her because you know she became the hero and solved the problem that Kath was worried about so she goes on to Peter Peter's property because she had seen Peter's wife turn into the Jabberwock basically and so she's like I know your wife is the Jabberwock I'm gonna go confront you about this so Peter does the only logical thing he knows how to do to protect his wife and locks Marianne up in one of the pumpkins he had designed to lock his wife up in and this woman (laughs) has her little dreamer cap on she's like i'm dreaming i'm gonna be the hero of the story right and she sits there in this fucking pumpkin and she's (laughs) like suddenly i can't do anything (laughs) and i'm like how do you get trapped in a fucking pumpkin like it's a pumpkin dig your way out I'm like, if you're dreaming about being the hero, you would have dreamed about having a heroic escape and still solving all your problems. But the bitch was being too goddamn lazy about the whole thing. And she just sat there. And because of that, because she was trapped in this pumpkin the whole time, Kath has to come and save her sorry little ass, which ends with just dying. So Marianne, I stand by that. 
<laughs> not to go on a rant or anything in this podcast is astronomical marianne is not safe here okay get because, out of here marianne <laughs> first of all kath had her as a confidant about everything mm-hmm. that was going on with jess she was like look you're my best friend i'm gonna tell you all of these things i would tell my best friend because you in my eyes you've earned the truth for that and mm-hmm. so she told marianne everything and marianne goes i was so concerned about you that i told your parents everything and then jess becomes a wanted fucking criminal because marianne couldn't keep her goddamn trap shut i'm just saying if you're gonna tell someone things that your bestie told you don't tell it to the parents the fuck is wrong with you i'm gonna stop cursing i'm so sorry i'm very heated about this this is an explicit podcast bestie you go off no okay i would agree with that because marianne like she was like she's he's the strange man taking you to a strange place and no one knew where you were and then she turns around and does that and then like later in the castle she like visits Catherine on like her wedding day and she's like so see you didn't ask me to like be one of your maids in the castle and Catherine was like yep (laughs) and Marianne's like what she's so shocked by that but like here's the thing Marianne saw the way that Catherine felt about him she saw how Jest was with her Mm -hmm. because she was there for a lot of it I mean, she didn't see the solitary interactions, but she saw how much Jess was worried about her at the theater when he took her to like go get healed and stuff. And she went, eh, he's not a good guy. I'm going to tell everybody everything and then he's going to be ruined forever. Like, I think Kath, the, you know, I'm with Kath wholeheartedly now. She had every right to blame Marianne. Okay, you know who I'm going to blame? <laughs> who do you blame? I actually am curious about this. Who do you blame? I'm going to blame Hada. I'm going to oh, blame Hada. Good choice. I might even make the argument that he is a character foil for Catherine and they bring out the worst in each other. Because here's the thing. I agree with that. Here's the thing. Hada, of course, like goes back and forth between hearts and chess and he brings back his magic little ingredients. And among those ingredients were pumpkin seeds that he tried to sell to Peter Peter. Peter Peter rejected him and he threw them down in his patch and they grew. And basically he's like, I didn't tell you to eat the pumpkins. I'm not the one who made the pumpkins grow. And he also kind of absolves himself of all this blame because even with the hats, Catherine was like, don't you think that these could be dangerous to play devil's advocate for Catherine here? And he says, no, that's bad business. Why the fuck would I make dangerous hats? And then as we see with Marianne, his hats can be dangerous and they Mm -hmm. have been. And I feel like him being in denial of that is very similar to Catherine being in denial of the fact that she ever had any agency at all. I feel like how to is very much of the same mindset in terms of his own agency and how his work is an extension of him, whether he likes it or not. He's like, oh, blame it on fate. And it's like, no, but you did bring it here. It is kind of your fault. So I'm going to blame Hatta. Absolutely. Okay. And I agree with that because he did the exact same thing Kath did. He didn't Mm -hmm. accept the guilt for the actions that he had, the part that he played. And he was so torn up about Justin, didn't want to like wallow in all of that self-pity and everything that he let himself go mad just like she did. Mm -hmm. They are two sides of the same coin. Hard fucking same. You are absolutely correct. I'm so glad we arrived to this conclusion. Because, oh my god, they're both wonderful characters, but Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, they both have this kind of deluded perceptions of themselves and what they can do and what they're capable of and what they have done and what they're responsible for, you know? Take just out of the the factor, right? I think that they could have been friends. I think they would have been great friends. I think they would have gotten along well. But because of the whole, like, jealousy thing that was going on, they were enemies. Well, here's the thing. I feel like Hada acknowledged that his love for Jess was unrequited, but also in the same vein, he wanted Jess to be happy. But he saw how torn up that Kath was making Jess in that she kept rejecting him and she kept being like, oh, we can't be together. But she also kept kind of, like, taking that step towards him where it's like, oh, maybe we can be together. And so he felt that... she was playing with his heart and that made him angry. He he got mad that he saw his close friend and this person that he loved having his heart played with by this woman who thought that she didn't have any agency. And he's like, I'm going to fucking call you out on that. And he has every right to. I would mm-hmm. be mad too if that happened to one of my close friends. But even with that, when Jess was telling him or showing him that he was happy with Catherine and he wanted to be with Catherine and all of that, like Hatter did the exact thing that, you know, he's done with everything else and he ignored it. Because that wasn't the version he wanted to see of the story. I would agree with that. I do think that Hada sought out to seek the worst in Catherine after he got the sense that she was playing with Jess's heart. I feel like the Raven kind of figured it out and forgave Catherine in a way. Even though he originally also was with Hada on the fact that like, hey, you need to cut it out. We don't like you. 
he kind of grew into a understanding but had it just did nothing the thing that was interesting about that to me is the whole point of them coming to hearts was to have just make kath fall in love with him so when that happened hada was suddenly pissed off well he was mad because just loved her back i know but it's still like seriously <laughs> he's like, like i thought i would be okay with it <laughs> <laughs> anyway when Very you tell character. your ex they can go date someone else but then you're like actually just kidding <laughs> When, when you tell your ex that they can go to date someone else, but then they go and date someone else. <laughs> <laughs> All um, right. Should we go on to final ratings? We can go on to final ratings. Do you want to go first? Sure. Okay. I'm going to rate this book a four out of five. I enjoyed four. it. A four. For me, four is a good rating. That's like baseline. I loved the book. We're happy. Oh, for sure. Above okay. that, above that just kind of like surpassed expectations. Okay. I rate off vibes. Okay. The vibes here hit home. That's a four immediately. Okay. Mm-hmm. I was engaged pretty much through the whole story it just didn't like grip me in a i want to reread this immediately kind of a way you know mm-hmm. so yeah it's a four oh, i don't know the ending kind of it wasn't amazing to me so fair enough i would recommend this book to pretty much anybody i think anybody that is okay with not having happy endings <laughs> i would recommend this to teenage girls going through their angst phase where they only shop at hot topic i would recommend this to 14 year old me i think i would love it i think i would have enjoyed it a lot more at a younger age yeah, I still like it. I'm going to mm-hmm. reread it another day, but what would you rate it? I've been thinking about this. And Honor, you know, I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm a hard nut to crack. I'm a hard cookie to please. Honor, I'm going to give this one a five out of five. Oh my God. That's your first one. That's my first five out of five. Back to oh, back. So Jeez, exciting. Heartless for you, heartless for me. I love this fucking book. I think that there are so many good ways to look at it. There are so many different characters to view the story mm-hmm. from like the angle of. I think there's a million different ways to interpret it. I thoroughly enjoyed it start to finish. The prose was like a big thing for me. Tonally, Mm -hmm. it was there. It was there for me. And I just enjoyed it. I was immersed in the world. And it wasn't, it was long, but it wasn't boring. It was a journey that I was excited to take. And, you know, sometimes that's all you can fucking ask. For me, this is a five out of five. I'll say it. I love that. I will say... If it was just rating off characters, like if it's just Jess for rating off, I would also say five out of five. <laughs> well, I'm not just rating off characters. I know, <laughs> but I know. But that that was my thought as you were talking about. In terms of book boyfriends, five out of five. Five out of five. Like up there with Hideo. I actually told you, I was like, kick Hideo out. I'm going to take Jess. You did. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> you said forget him. Old news. Last week's news. We're done. I said I found a better one. <laughs> Okay, are you going to start our outro? Sure. If you like this podcast, we do have an Instagram, a TikTok, and a YouTube all under the handle Young Adult Adult Reviews. We post a lot of book-related content and also teasers for books that we'll be reading in the future. Go ahead and give us a follow and a like. And if you want, you can drop suggestions in there. We might listen to them. We might not. Our podcast comes out bi-weekly. That's every other week, not twice a week. That is too much reading. Too much reading for twice a week. (laughs) Me doing that literally every time where I'm reading like three books and four books between the ones we're supposed to read. (laughs) You want to say the thanks? Oh, yeah. Uh, Thank you for listening. We appreciate you. We are so happy you listened to our podcast. And that's a wrap. (laughs) Solid. My guitar is. (laughs) Oh, did did it like resonate with your guitar? Hi, room tone.